You ready for your intro? Yes. All right, here we go. All right, everyone. So we have the organizer of the Office 365 Saturday New York, four-time MVP, co-organizer of M365 Philly Virtual, a community leader and more. He writes code, he makes his own pizza. Please welcome Tom Daly. Thanks, Jason. <laughs> Great intro, very exciting. Very excited to be here. All right, let's get started. I have a lot of information to deliver and let's hope we get through it all in time. Um, so thanks again. Thanks for having me, Jason. Thanks for letting me help out organizing. Uh, unfortunately, we have to do a virtual event this year, um, so we'll make the best of it. Um, let's get started with their slides. Here we go. Hopefully everybody can see everything clearly. Um, just shoot me if you're in there, if you're listening, shoot me where you're from just so I get an idea where people are coming in from. All right, let's move on. All right, so let's get started with our topic for today. This is going to be this. This topic is actually part. Uh, it's a small part of a larger topic that Jason actually was involved with, along with Manpreet, one of the other organizers and a couple other people in various cities. It's part of the Global M365 Developer Bootcamp. So the first section of this section of this um, larger bootcamp is actually the introduction to, to SPFX. So we're going to focus on that for this talk. Uh, again, this is a full day talk. All you'll have access to all the slides. You'll have access to all the notes. So if you if you like this session and you want to learn more, you can just take the slides and keep and uh, you know go on to session two and three and four. Again, here's the overall outline for the bootcamp, but we're, we're going to focus on session one. So we're going to talk about getting started. How do we get started with Office 365 development? Um, what do we have to do to our tenant to get set up in our tenant? What do we have to do on our computer, our client? And then we'll talk about the technologies involved with SPFX and we'll just deep dive right into what how to build our first web part with SPFX. So real quick, Jason introduced me a little bit about me. So I work for Soho Dragon. I'm the collaboration director. I also do a lot of development training for people. Um, I am formally like the branding guy probably for the New York, New Jersey area. I created so many intranet sites. It's, it's ridiculous with custom master pages and custom features. I really focus on the UI. I know everything about like what's going on on the front end, like how to customize things, the, the proper ways to do things. Again, community speaker. I've been doing this forever. I ran like nine or ten SharePoint Saturday New Yorks. Um, I do that every year at exactly at this time, we're not, which we're not having one this year. But I also organize boot camps like for New York, New Jersey. So I organize and Pennsylvania this year. So I organized the Azure boot camp in New Jersey. We did the M365, the O3, uh, O365 developer boot camps last year. Again, I blog, I have a couple GitHub projects um, and feel free to reach out to me on Twitter, connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm pretty easy to find. Any questions that you may have during the presentation, just put them in the channel. I will try to address them. Um, I'll try to address them at the end. I want to try to get through most of the material, uh, but I, I'm going to answer all the questions that you may have. So I'm going to go a little fast. I want to get through the slides in about 20 minutes and then get into demos for the rest of the session. OK, so session one. Highlighted in gold is exactly what we're going to talk about. Getting started, O365, tenant, client setup. So the first thing that you need to do, which I think everybody that wants to do or is doing SharePoint development, you should have your own tenant. So you need to go on to um, developer.microsoft.com and join the program. And what that program does is it gives you a renewable E3 license. So you'll have 25 users um, that you can play with. You have access to SharePoint, Teams, everything. You, you'll, I mean, within reason. So you get, you get most of the uh, features that you need for development. Of course, if you're going to do some things with Azure, you're going to probably have to get an Azure subscription. Um, but for the most part, you get your own tenant. And why, do, why, why is it a good idea to get your own tenant? because you can go in, into the back end and you can see how everything's set up. You can play with anything you want to play with. I have like six or seven tenants. Do I use them all? No, I use maybe two regularly. Um, the company I work for, they have their own tenant that they develop in. A uh, the clients I work for, they have their own tenants that they work in, but I also have my own and that's the one that I develop in because I have the superpower there to do whatever I want, set up 
app catalogs, run PowerShell against it. I don't have annoying MFA uh, for multi-factor authentication. So that's why it's really important. So every developer on my team that works with me, I suggest that they get their own tenant. It's a great way to start learning. You, if you break it, just set up a new one. No big deal. Go, it, it'll disappear in 30 days, uh, 90 days. All right, so what do we do to set up our Office 365 tenant? What, what are the steps that we actually have to do? There's not really much, right? Other than going online and signing up and clicking the button to provision provision the tenant. That's really what sets it up. There's only one more thing you need to do in order to start development. Um, and that's gonna be setting up an app catalog. So I have the instructions here and we'll, we'll walk through this, like the process of setting up the app catalog. So when your tenant's created, you're not gonna have, there's no app catalog. You can't deploy solutions right away. So you need to go into the admin tenant. You need to go and create this thing. Um, very simple, it's a couple steps. The instructions are right there. Um, if you want to go ahead and do that yourself. Again, like I said, when we get to the demos, I will show you all this in great detail. The next thing that you do, your, your tenant's provisioned with one site. That's like your root site. Um, if you want to start developing, I don't suggest you just jump into that one. Go and create a blank site. Right, get familiar with the process. If you're not used to it, creating sites, you want to go and create modern sites, right? So we don't want to be creating the older publishing sites. We want to be creating modern communication or modern team sites. It doesn't matter for development which one you choose. Just I usually typically go with um, the communication site because it's got a full width and it's just that's the one that I go with. But it doesn't make a difference if you're going to do development on the team site versus a communication site. Just note, it's got to be a modern site. The solutions will work in Classic. If you So if you're building something specifically for Classic, yeah, go ahead and do that. Create a test site for the Classic. But in this example, in this demo, we're going to be going with modern. All right, so what if you're using an existing tenant? Like say your company has like a share developer tenant. Um, just want to make a note of this because I use this almost all the time. I create what's called a site application, a site collection app catalog. All right, so the first one that you create is the tenant app catalog. That one is where all the global solutions get deployed. So anything that goes in there will be available across every single site within your tenant. Um, if you wanna sort of like fence yourself off in a sense, you can create a site collection app catalog, and I do that, and we'll go through this process. It's this three three PowerShell lines here that we just run, and it spins it up instantly. Okay, and that isolates you. So when you deploy solutions to this site-based app catalog, all your features are only all your solutions are only going to be available in that site. So you don't have developers conflicting, putting out different junk and and garbage that doesn't really work and polluting your, your global repository. So when the things are finalized and they're all ready to go, you can then move them up to the tenant level. And uh, this is how I kind of run most of my development stuff in the app uh, site collection app catalog. All right, all right. So the development environment. Let's go. Let's jump into the development environment. So what do we mean by development environment? Right. You used to if you're on prem. If you had a build in the past, you used to have to have a server, a SharePoint server for the most part. Um, you had to like compile DLLs and, and all that. You used to have to have Visual Studio Code, the one that take, that's like four gigabytes and takes like two hours to install, um, but not anymore, right? So now nowadays we're doing client-side development. What does that mean? That means we're doing, we can do work right on our laptop. It doesn't have to be a server. It doesn't. It doesn't have to be uh, like a remote desktop somewhere. Um, you can you can do it pretty much on any machine. It doesn't even have to be Windows. All right. So we just need to install a couple of things. We need to get our tool chain up and running. Um, one of those things that we need the the basis for all of this is Node.js. So so Node.js. We'll get into what these are in the next couple of slides. I forgot. I just I just added. Um, more details about these. So we're going to need to install Node.js and, and we'll get into what that is. We're going to need a code editor. We're going to need to install Yeoman and Gulp and we'll talk about that. And here's the commands to do that if you already kind of know what those are. And then we'll have to install what's known as the SharePoint generator and that that's the files that 
it tells the gen uh, yeoman what to do, how to set up the projects. Um, I put this in there once the first time that you're ever doing any development and you create your first project, you're going to have to run Gulp Trust Dev Cert, and that just allows you to serve files from your machine from your from your machine up until up to your SharePoint site or up to your test site. Um, so that's just the one critical step that if you miss this, nothing seems to work right. All right, and then I personally use Google Chrome for the development. Um, yes, I support IE 11, but I do most of my development in Google Chrome. Um, you can use Firefox. You can use any other web modern. Let's say modern. Edge is considered modern, um, but do not use IE 11, right? That's it does not have the, the rich tool set for web development. It's just it's so outdated. It needs to it needs to just go away. <laughs> I'm saying that as nice as possible. Um, so IE 11 is like everybody's nightmare right now um, that does SharePoint development. Why do I use Chrome? I love the ecosystem that comes with Chrome. There's a lot of really good, great plugins. Um, SP Editor is one of my favorite plugins, and that allows me to quickly launch like the remote workbench and the local workbench, and I'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Then there's tools for React, like the React developer tools, which allow you to inspect your your um, React components that are on the page and give you the state and props values and kind of see how things are working. It's got another great one called Cache Killer, which allows you to um, clear cache on every single refresh. And that's that's one that I use. I turn that on during every development because I hate cache. Uh, I hate when it, things get stuck and I just hit F5 and it just doesn't seem to, to, to clear. So it just reassures me that things are clear already and I don't have to go crazy hitting F5. Um, all these instructions can be found at officially at the Microsoft.com website. That's how I learned. I learned to go to Microsoft.com. I follow every single instruction when all this stuff first came out. Um, now there's more advanced training. There's YouTube videos. There's tons of blogs. But again, I always go and I always learn official Microsoft way first and kind of branch out from there. Okay. All right, next up, let's talk about in detail what these things are. So Node.js, it's an executable. You have to have rights to put this on your computer. So if you're having a machine that's kind of locked down, uh, it may not work, right? So you need to install this thing. And the, if you go to the Node website, you'll see it's version 12 right now, and that's the current, um, the LTS version, and then the latest version, which is like the more modern one, 14. So don't download either of those. You need to go to other downloads and you need to get version 10. So SPFX runs a couple versions behind on everything because they have to test. It will never work with sort of the latest and greatest like Node, um, not right now. So get version 10. It also works with eight, but the late you know get the latest version. That's it's got some it's got improvements in there. Um, so what I'll what I'm going to do in the next few, few slides is sort of event, uh, explain what it do, what this thing does, what the tool or the utility does, and then give you sort of the broken down version, the simpler version. So Node is an asynchronous event driven JavaScript runtime. So that's kind of uh, some people may get that. Some people may say like, what does that even mean? Basically, it runs JavaScript on your computer, right? So it allows JavaScript files to run. Your code will run on your computer. It serves, um, it'll serve your files too. It, it can act as like a mini little web server. All right, so that's the simplest form. I mean, you know, feel free to yell at me in the in the comments, but I feel like that's the simplest broken down version. So when you install Node, you get this thing called Node Package Manager. It's, it's an online repository of packages. It allows you for quick installation of your projects. And, you know, you can think of those projects as third party things like that are available on GitHub, right? It's basically an app store, but for JavaScript. So how you have an app store for your phone, Android, iOS, it's got it's basically an app store for um, just getting those packages into your project. So we have Yeoman. Yeoman is a scaffolding engine. So it's also this is installed on top of Node. So you install it well into Node. Um, it scaffolds out your new projects. It helps write configurations that like you can answer questions. It's sort of like a workflow. Uh, you can, it'll create the necessary build tasks and, and download your dependencies from NPM. Also, 
uses um, this thing called a generator, which is like a definition. And, and you can have a generator, like SharePoint has a generator, Teams has a generator. And what it does is it sets up the projects differently, it scaffolds out the folders, sets up um, your gulp file, and some of the other configurations and the questions that you're going to answer. It's going to do certain things. So in, in uh, summary, it's basically it's based on a template and it creates directories. It sets up projects and it downloads those NPM uh, dependencies that you need to build your project. All right, so let's talk about Gulp. Gulp is an, um, a toolkit that automates and enhances workflow within your projects, right? It does repetitive tasks over and over and over, and you can chain them into a pipeline to, yeah, to create build pipelines. All right, so what does that really mean? It's a task runner. It does very simple tasks in parallel or series. So when you're building your files, it will copy a file from a folder to a folder. It will rename things. It will minify. It will um, it will bundle in a sense too. So it does all those things that if you save a file, you want it to just rebuild, right? Over and over and over. That's the technology that does that. I'm going to mention Webpack, and you're gonna you don't necessarily need to know what this is right away, but it's a JavaScript, it compiles JavaScript modules, right? So it handles dependencies between modules and organizes the code correctly so that it runs properly. It also transpiles code. So the code written in TypeScript, it will transpile it into ES2015, something that browsers can understand. Browsers can't understand TypeScript. They ha it has to be like boiled down into basic JavaScript language that browsers understand. All browsers understand different versions of JavaScript in a sense, not JavaScript, uh, but all ver all all the browsers um, they handle JavaScript differently based on what standards they implement, right? So when I said I use Chrome, it handles JavaScript a higher level JavaScript. It knows how to handle that. When you talk about IE, it just like barely handles it. Um, so that's what that's what I'm talking about there. So why do we need Webpack? It takes all your files, all your dependencies, and bundles them and creates one file. That's in short what it does. <clears throat> so think about JavaScript. If you've written JavaScript before, if you call a function before you defined it, it won't work, right? So same thing with Webpack. You just write your code. You don't care at what order does the file load. It does it all. It makes sure that it's all there lo loaded for you. All right, so let's move on to TypeScript. We're doing good here. So what is this TypeScript thing? Uh, it's an open source language by Microsoft. It's basically a superset of JavaScript. So it's based on JavaScript and it compiles into plain JavaScript, but it allows you to do things like type checking um, and also get compile time errors, right? Those are the more useful features. It also allows you to build code like an object-oriented language, like you can do classes, you can do inheritance, you can do um, interfaces and create definitions. Uh, so yeah, it makes C sharp. I mean, I'm sorry, it makes JavaScript just uh, like similar to C sharp. I'm not gonna say the same. It makes it more like an ob object-oriented language um, in a sense, and that's the easiest way to say that. I love it because it allows you to create interfaces and pass. You can pass a variable, you know, in JavaScript, you can say var x equals five, you know, and is that's a number, but you can also add a number and a string together. You know, it doesn't really care what you're doing um, too much. It's very loose, like the rules are kind of loose. So Java, so the TypeScript allows you to, if you're gonna add two numbers or a number and a string, it'll give you an error. Um, at compile time instead of you passing a string into a function that accept, that's thinking it needs a number, right? So that's why it's important. All right, so we covered all the basics, right? We can start to get into the meat and potatoes here about what is SPFX. And then we're gonna jump into a bunch of demo stuff that hopefully will be exciting. <laughs> So let's talk about the SharePoint framework. Um, what is it exactly, right? If you're, first, if you're new, what is it in a few quick little bullets? It's a page web part model that allows you to customize and build for SharePoint, right? So you can build for SharePoint online. 
It's the customization model for SharePoint Online. It supports open source tooling. So I mentioned all those tools right there. Those are all open source, right? Yeoman's open source, Gulp's open source, TypeScript is open source. They're all community built projects, right? It easily integrates with SharePoint data. I mean, what does that mean? That means I can, when it's on the page, I can communicate with SharePoint. I don't have to do special authentication. I don't have to, um, I can work with the uh, Sh SharePoint search. I can work with SharePoint lists and libraries. I can work with user profiles. There's a lot I can do. And it also even works easily now with Azure AD and Microsoft Graph. Like, well, through Microsoft Graph, you can connect to Azure AD, you can connect to other things. So, and the support right now still is uh, SharePoint 2016 feature back two, and 2019 and Office 365. So Office 365 will have the latest and greatest version that's updated all the time. Um, it seems like an, a new version of SPFX comes out on scene. It seems like every couple months, right? Um, it's up to 10 now and and uh, it's been like it seems like every couple months a new one comes out and they're always adding features. SharePoint 2019, I want to say that it's it's on 1.6 something like um, I want to say it's on 1.4. Sorry about that. Because, yeah, it just doesn't have the latest and greatest. What they have to do is they have to take the code from Office 365, freeze it, build it for 2019, put it in a feature pack or a release, and it just takes a long time for that to happen. So it'll never be like it'll never have the latest and greatest features, and it may not ever have the latest and greatest features. There may be a time where it doesn't get a certain thing because it doesn't make sense, right? Um, Office 365 has different capabilities, different integra integrations than on-prem platforms. 2016, yes, you can do it. Um, if you're on 2016, you can build web parts. There's uh, certain things that you're just not going to be able to do. You're going to have to move up to 2019. OK. Right, so I mentioned before about it's running in the page. It's your web part, right? It runs as the context of the user. So no longer can you elevate privileges and do things you normally couldn't do. It it runs as the user. It, the web parts code is running on the user's browser. So we know who the user is. We can interact with the user, but we can't elevate. We would have to write some sort of Azure function, call that function to do to do something on, on behalf of the user or do something for the user that you normally couldn't do. Also, there's no iframes. Your code, it's directly on the page. So what does that mean? It means it means that you can make mobile web parts much easier. You are on the page. You, you're just like you're a real member of the site. You're not in an iframe anymore. Now, <clears throat> you could be in an iframe if you want. You can opt into that, and that's for domain isolated web parts. If say you want to protect your code, um, you're a third party vendor, you may just want to isolate your stuff. Um, so you, you would maybe do that. The controls, again, rendered in the page. That's important to me. It, it's easier for for mobile development. Um, I don't like being in an iframe. You cannot, you know, you can't, it just adds more complication. It's framework agnostic, meaning you can write, you can use SPFX with plain JavaScript if you really want to. You can use it with jQuery, you can use it with React, handlebars, knockout, and Angular. Um, when it first came out, that's what they said. They said, you know, here it's agnostic, but they really lean towards React. So if you're new, you're just starting out, like there, there's a lot of support with React. There's a lot of blogs, there's a lot of guidance with React. So my opinion is if you're gonna start out now, start learning React. If you're an Angular developer, you're gonna have a lot of problems working with SPFX if you're using just regular Angular. If you're using Angular elements, then you have an easier path into SPFX. There's a, a generator that is out there, a community generator that you can use to build Angular elements. Um, you can scaffold the solution with Angular element support. Out of the box, it's React, nothing, or Knockout. Um, I believe that's right. Yeah, Knockout. We'll see in a second. All right, so I never click it, so <laughs> I, think I almost ignore it. The tool chain is based on open source. We talked about that. Um, end users can create their own solutions and then you can deploy them to the site app catalogs. You could deploy it to the global app catalogs. 
All right, and then it's important to note that the web parts can be built on both classic and modern, right? So that's important. It's backwards compatible will work almost the same. Uh, so that's very key. Uh, OK, last slide here and we'll get into the demos. Let's look at the tool chain really quickly. Give you a comparison. If you're not if you don't know anything about on prem, this will never make any sense to you. If you're from all prem world, you may might have heard these these terms here. So you have Microsoft.net as the back end. Um, what runs the code? We have Node, which runs the code. Yeah, had NuGet to get your packages and your dependencies, your DLLs. We now have NPM to do that. We also used to use the large um, Visual Studio Code. Now we're using Visual Studio Code, um, the Visual Studio Code editor. It's like the lightweight version. I think I messed it up. Visual Studio is the is the big one, and Visual Studio Code is the lightweight version. And then Yeoman. So Yeoman scaffolds out your solution. In Visual Studio, you had the templates that created like your projects. Uh, C Sharp was the language you wrote in, most people. And then now we have TypeScript, so we're writing in TypeScript. MS Build was the build engine that kind of put your projects together, created the package files. We now have Gulp and Webpack in that. So it all lines up, it all seems to make sense, but it's all very different if you're just starting out coming from that world. All right, so let's jump into, let's take a look. I lost my mouse somewhere, there it is. Okay, so we're, we've completed the, um, the slide portion. Let's jump into the demo. So what I'm gonna do, yes, I'm opening a command line. I wanna just run through some things really quickly. Let me find my browser, bring that over. All right, so again, Node.js is installed. It's an executable, you just run it. You know, you just install it. Once you have it installed, you can hit node and you can see I'm in somewhere else, right? We can have, you have NPM. We're gonna need to install a couple things. So let me scroll up on the slides. Scroll up on the slides and we're gonna kick these things off because they take a little time. So the things that we need to do, we have to install node. Um, I'm not gonna go through that because it's literally just download the file and then click next, next, next. Visual Studio Code, That's you can download that here. That's just next, next, next as well. What we need to do is install, once Node's installed, we wanna install Gulp and, Gulp and Yo, I just deleted it. So we'll paste that in here and I'll show you what that looks like. Because there's a dash G, it's gonna install it globally and we don't need to worry about where it's going. All right, so we're going to let those install. It should only take a few seconds because they're small. While that's going, let's jump over to the web. So I said developer office365.com. We're going to want to go here. It's the first thing that you see when you type in developer office 365. You're going to say join now. Um, it needs a live ID. If you have one connected to another site, probably won't work. Go create a new live ID. Go to outlook.com, create just another live ID. I've, I have created like so many of them for every boot camp that I've run that, you know, they kind of block me from doing it now. So once you have this live ID, you just click join now and it'll provision. It takes about 15, 20 minutes maybe to provision SharePoint, Teams and all that stuff. Once you do that, go to portal office365.com and I'm there right now but this brings you to your you know your landing page for office and it'll show all your apps available if you don't see SharePoint or Teams it's not yet provisioned um, the most important thing is to go to the admin center we want to go to the admin center yes we want to go to the admin center this is still installing and you want to get familiar with this area. This is the O365 admin center, but down towards the bottom, the you'll see the other admin centers for all the other products. Where we're, we'll pretty much be playing in the SharePoint world. So we'll open up the SharePoint admin center. Then I said before, the first thing you need to do is create the app catalog. And to do that, you go to more features, under apps, create open. I mean, click open. 
and then you're going to click your app catalog here. So I already have one. I don't want to create another one, um, but it would just ask you a few questions like what's the name of the app catalog? I usually call it apps. Who's the admin? What's the time zone? That's it. Where you're going to deploy, you're going to click on apps for SharePoint and you would deploy your packages here. So I just want to give you an overview of the app catalog um, while this is, stuff is still installing. Again, I, I kind of knew this is going to take a while. It's already installed, so we'll just let that go while I run through run through this real quick. Where we're going to deploy, we want to create a site. Um, we're going to create a site real quick. Like I said, uh, I used communication site. We're going to click blank. I'm going to say demo one. And I will put my admin account, Mr. Philly. Create that. It literally takes a few seconds to create. Uh, finishing up. Okay, site created. So let's go over to our demo site. All right, take a break because NPM's done. Next thing we need to do is install the generator. So I'm going to paste this in. Oh, can't copy it. Uh, I'm going to copy over the generator code. I'm going to install that. All right, that's the second thing you need to do. So we'll let that run. And we're going to do two things on the site just to show you really quickly what how easy it is. Oh, turn your phones off, people. All right, so you can see here that there's no app catalog for my site. I want to create one. Um, so how do I do that really quickly? Let's. I'm going to open up. PowerShell. Oh, you have to download the SharePoint Online PowerShell. And then, oh no, I just lost my cheat sheet. There it is. All right, so yes, I lost my, I lost my cheat sheet. Hold on. But I have a backup. So can't show you the screen. I'm just typing in the I'm just typing in the commands on the on the one side. I'm going to paste them in here. So we're connecting to the SPO service. This is going to pop up a window. Can't show you because my password's on there. That's that's the real reason. Log in. You're already signed in. I am already signed in. All right, this is going to fail because I am signed into the Teams tenant and it's now blocking me. All right, no big deal. All right, so what this would have done is it would have created an app catalog. So let's go, I got to back up too. It's getting hung up on my account and I don't want to sign out just in case anything goes bad. What that's going to do is going to create an app catalog right here, apps for SharePoint. And these ones will be isolated to this site in particular, so you don't have to worry about that. OK, and I've deployed the solution here. We're, we'll just go back to demo one. Now let's talk. Let's do the SPFX stuff now. Let's talk about the SPFX um, generator. So we're going to make a directory demo one. We're going to go into the demo one and we're going to say yo. Now this launches Yeoman. Yeoman, you could type yo at Microsoft dot, uh, Microsoft slash SharePoint, but I just type yo for right now. Let's see how fast or slow this is going to be. All right, so you can see here's our generator SharePoint. It's installed. I also have the Teams generator and I got a few other generators. So I'm just going to pick SharePoint and we'll walk through these questions so you can see, you know, get an idea of what, how hard this is and how easy. So there's Mr. Yeoman. What do we want to call our solution? You would give it a solution name. My solution. What version do you want to support? You know, we're really focusing on online. What folder do you want to make this in? We're already in the folder, so I'll say current folder. Do you want to deploy this tenant wide? Absolutely not right now. It's a web part. I do not want to do that. Will the components require special permissions? No, not right now. And then you have the ability to do um, a library extension. You can do extensions. These are uh, list field customizers, application customizers, and web parts. So we want to just take a look at the web parts. This is the you know, simplest one to get started with, and we're going to call it my solution. Right, my solution, my solution. 
here's where you get to pick your framework. So you get, oh, look, look at that. It's, there's only JavaScript and React now. I thought so. So they must have removed Knockout. That's why it was kind of like, couldn't really recall it. So I'm going to pick React. That's what I'm going to be building. And now this is Yeoman creating that, that structure. So it's creating the folder structure. Now, once it's created the folder structure, which takes two seconds, it's going to take, it's going to do npm install, which is going to download hundreds of megabytes of files, thousands of files to your computer. Um, and it's going to take probably 15, 20 minutes for that to happen. We're not going to wait for that. So let's go back to, let's go back to the, let's go, let's pretend that we, it, it all came down. The next thing that we're going to do is hit code. Uh, code dot and that's going to launch Visual Studio Code. So it will appear on one of my many screens any second. Where are you? All right, it did not show up something like something stuck. Maybe because it was in PowerShell, it didn't want to do it. I don't know. Code, let's get it up again here. Okay, I know exactly where it is. It's on the mystery screen above me that is turned off. Uh, yes, okay, hold on. Turning, pulling this screen down. I didn't want to turn it on because it's it's up high. All right, sorry about that, people, for everybody. Let's uh, turn that back off. All right, so I have a lot of monitors, um, just monitoring different things. All right, so here we go. We're, we're in our test project. Let's just point out a couple things really quickly. So... Before we get started, there's a number of files here. I'm not going to go into great detail about it, but we talked about Gulp. Here's the instructions for Gulp. Talked about NPM. This is where all your NPM packages go, and you can see there's quite a few. Um, here's where our source code is. So when you scaffold out the solution, you're going to start out with this web part. It won't be called Hello World. It'll be called whatever you named your solution. Um, and inside here, this is the point point of this is the starting point of your entire web part this ts file right there's a manifest which defines what the web part you know some of the properties on the web part like what icon it uses the description and title and then inside here you're going to see the get property pane this is where properties get sent over so web part properties right web part properties are created and this one in particular is going to be called description we have things like interfaces up top, right? So the interface defines like what this component is. Um, and then we go in, in the in the render function. This will probably look really foreign at first if, you, if you're new to this, but over time you start to see it, it makes, it's not that complicated once you see a few of these and you start to like understand the, the pieces. So the render function creates the React element. This is where the React element gets created. And what happens is we're passing in the initial web part property into this React element. So where is this React element? Um, you can chase it down. You can see it's called Hello World. And if I look at the imports, this is the import for that. So this is where it's coming from, components slash Hello World. So all your React components should go into this folder here. Now, we're just going to have one for simplicity in this project. I want to get this thing built within the next like two minutes. Um, this is your first React file. So this is the TSX, TypeScript React file. I'm not going to go into details about the syntax and all that, but here you can see we have the TypeScript point, which is like we're creating this element with this interface. So this element expects, this element expects a, um, an object properties. Right, and if we look at what the properties are, it's a description string. So it's all, you cannot make a mistake. I cannot say, I cannot say, oh, we're going to have another one called string, and I'm going to say, hello. This would cause an error. You would not be able to do that. And that's the TypeScript part. So there you go. It has to match the definition. All right, so what do we have here? We're going to build this. So before we actually build the package, what we're going to do is we're going to um, just play around. So I'm going to run gulp serve. Gulp serve is going to spin up a local web server and it's going to serve the files to SharePoint. It's going to serve the files to the local host. 
um, the remote, the local workbench, that's what I meant to say. So give that a second. I'm actually going to kill the NPM process on the other window because it's going to slow this whole thing down. All right, so you're going to see a bunch of things going on. It's loading up a browser, which it just loaded up my Fire, uh, Firefox browser, but we're going to stick to we're going to stick to Chrome. So I'm just going to take I'm just going to take the URL and I'm going to go over to my test site and I'm going to load the local workbench. All right, so here's the local workbench and I want to just make sure that once the thing's done building, right? Or here's all the build steps. This is all the build process. What I'm looking for, what I'm waiting for is when it says reload. That's when I know it's kind of done. There's Webpack that's doing its thing. Um, all these things copying assets, probably part of the gulp process. There you go, reload. So what that does is allows our local host, you can see we're at local host, to serve our web part. And this thing's special and it's picking it up from here. So if I say, welcome to M365, again on uh, day two you're going to see the build run again that's gulp watching your file changes doing all those processes again now since we're on the local workbench this will automatically refresh but the, i just want to show you the local workbench you can have web part properties you can change hello um how are you and you can see it's reactive it'll update um, now the workbench is great for prototyping and kind of like laying things out see there you go um, it's great for prototyping but you can interact with SharePoint directly so I don't typically use the local workbench too much what I normally use is the remote workbench and or I deploy it directly to the site but let's talk about the remote workbench the remote workbench is the is this workbench file on your office 365 site so if I go to my demo site and I mentioned that great plugin SP editor, I can click on this. I don't have to remember the URL of these things. It has cool things here where you can launch the local workbench. You can launch the local um, workbench remote and then you can load debug and that's the more advanced one we're not going to get into. So let's load the remote workbench. So this looks very much the same, except if you look at the URL, it's coming from my SharePoint site. My Office 365 SharePoint site has web parts already in there. So now I need to find my web part. Whoops, hello. So there's my web part. Now, how is this serving files from my computer up into Office 365? That's what we said before. So if I change that to day three, I'll let that reload. It's gonna be pulling the files from my, Computer, that's because we, we ran that gulp trust dev cert. And the workbench tells SharePoint to load the JavaScript files, not from SharePoint, but load it from the computer, localhost. All right, so it reloaded again. Now the, the remote workbench doesn't do that um, automatically, it doesn't reload automatically. So we'll just hit, we have to hit refresh. Welcome to day three, here you go. So as you can see, you know, it's serving the files locally. We're using it in SharePoint and then we can now start to develop. We can start to add functionality and we can start to test here. Um, I still don't use the I still don't use the remote workbench that frequently. Some developers like it a lot because it, it, you have you're isolated to your page. I like to sometimes deploy it into a site and I do what's known as the load debug URLs. But that again, you can look into that. Um, I just want to lay that out there. So let's go say that we're done here. We're done with our, our project. I want to walk through some of the commands that you're going to need to know in order to effectively like build the package for SharePoint. So we were serving it. That's actually doing a build process. But the first thing you normally will do is if you if you go in, you would say gulp build. Now, if you had some things already built out, I, I also do gulp clean and that sort of like removes the older stuff. So again, like that's kind of my, my process is clean, build, bundle, and then package. Uh, that's just what I, I just do it. I actually wrote a script that does that so I don't have to type these things because I hate typing them over and over and over and over.
All right, let's keep going. All right, this thing's building. All right, so the first one's build. The next thing you're going to need to know is to bundle. And and then if you don't if you don't put dash dash ship, when you load the web part, it's actually going to look for them for on your computer on your local host. So we want to do gulp bundle dash dash ship. Now this is going to package it, get it ready so that when you deploy it to the site assets, it'll host it from the site assets library. So you don't need a CDN, um, you don't need Azure. You can host your, you can build your SPFX web parts and they can be hosted from within your site. So there's no additional things that you used to have to do. All right, so while that's loading, we want to get ready to deploy this. And like I said, I didn't have, I don't have, um, I don't have a site collection app catalog here, but that's not a problem. What I'll do is I'll go to apps and let's close some of these things out so I don't get too confused because we're going to wrap up in a second. We'll close all these to the right. All right, so um, while this thing's building, can take a minute to do that webpack thingy. We want to we want to just get ourselves in the correct position. So we have our app catalog, apps for SharePoint. And then on the other side, I have, whoops, don't mess up, don't type your code while you're doing this because you want it to work when you finish. Next one is package solution dash dash ship. And what this is going to do is bundle it all up, get it all ready for SharePoint. And it's going to create a SharePoint folder if you don't have it. And it's going to create the SPPKG file. So I already have that there, but it, it'll just overwrite it. Package solution doesn't take too long. And we don't have anything in there, so it should only take a couple seconds. Done. I'm going to do this. I'm going to right click, reveal and explore. I'm going to minimize that. Now I have the file over here on the other screen. I'm just going to drag and drop. And I'm going to click deploy. Once I do that, once it's deployed, I can go to my site and I can click add an app. And to filter things down, there's nothing in here, but just I always do this because most sites have a bunch of stuff. I click from my organization and now I can see what the apps are available. Now this will show everything that's in the app catalog. And if I had a site app catalog, it'll show that as well. So I'm going to click that and load it. These take more than two minutes to, to load, so we're going to let that go and we're going to jump back over to the demo two site that's already done. Right, because we could sit here. This is uh, runs on a background timer. You do. Oh, wow. So when I did this last night, it took 15 minutes. It, it was almost instant today, so we don't need the demo two site. Let's continue. Go back to home. I'll show you. Uh, what the net last step is. So we're going to click edit. I'm going to add it to the page. And we just need to type in what it is. Hello world. All right. So exactly what we built Philly day three, we can republish. Now I'll show you one more thing before we go. Gulp serve. I now have two minutes left on the clock here. Um, so we'll run gulp serve. This is what I talked about earlier, the debug URLs. Now if I click my SP editor and I click load debug manifest URLs, this is how I do most of my development. It's going to prompt you and say, oh, are you sure we're going to load unsafe scripts? Load those unsafe scripts. This is the other gulp serve running. Close that. Load debug scripts. And what's that? You can see in the URL something's going on here. Load SPFX true load from localhost. So what this is now doing, which is um, like amazing, I love this, is, is now we don't have a day four, but now if I update this, what it does is it rebuilds and I'm now live within my page. Once this is built, it will, it will show you that. So we'll give that a second um, to finish building. But this allows you to almost troubleshoot web parts in the in the wild like live like in production in qa 
as they sit. So this gives you that ability to make changes to it locally that no one else sees. Um, so this is why I really like that. And I like the fact that it, it's it's on a real page. The workbench isn't necessarily how it's going to interact in its own environment. You know, there could be conflicts and things. Um, so I like to see it. I like to see it in its page. If the page has a ton of web parts, not a good development experience. You want to build it on something that has like zero, you know, zero web parts, ideally, because it just slows things down when other things are on the page. All right, so that's reloaded. I'm just going to hit refresh and we wrap it up just to show you. It's, just, it's going to say day four. Day four, so we're pulling code live from our computer. Um, and this is how you get started. This is the introduction. From there, you, you the sky's the limit. You can go on to learn everything else, React, uh, TypeScript. You can learn, you need to learn REST. You need to learn everything else, SharePoint. All right, really quickly, we're gonna, we're done here. Um, let's just go to the last slide. I got one more housekeeping. Oh, we're done. So Jason, I don't know if there's any questions. If not, I'm gonna just put the last slide on for the survey, I mean not survey, I got, there's 133 slides in this deck, so how do you get it? That's always a question. Please no do the reviews. Hold on, we're almost there. All right, please do the reviews. Boom, okay. Please do the reviews, here we go, the feedback. Right, my slides are live up on Tom Daly SlideShare. SlideShare, Tom Daly, and I talked about those resources. You can get the resources there. If you want more training, you can click on Andrew Connell's got great training. I do training, uh, every company does training. If you wanna contact me, my, my contact information is there. But again, go to a SlideShare, type in Tom Daly, M365, and my slides are live right now. Any questions? Feel free to drop it in the channel. I know we're on a little bit of a lag, so. No, no questions. No questions. Feel free to contact me directly, connect me on Twitter, LinkedIn. All right, thank you so much for having me. I will drop off. I have to go produce the next couple sessions. Thanks, thank you, Jason. Thank you, Philly, for having me. Having me present. Right. Thanks, Kevin.